Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Today we have Kane. Now, Kane trained with us a while ago now, wasn't it? I think 2019, 2020. Um, Yeah, a few years ago. It was, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, Learn at your own pace, uh, PPL. Yep. Um, So that was then. Where are you now, Kane? Tell tell the viewers where you're now. Okay, so um, since 2020, I joined L3 in 2021. And I finished, I did all my um, ATPL training with them and I finished in April 2023. Oh, wow. Okay. So can you tell us um, a little bit about your journey through the PPL stages here with us? And then obviously tell us about your uh, integrated course with L3. Yeah. Okay. So um, so I started, I think, a couple of lessons actually back in 2018, end of 2018. Yeah. Um, obviously going through the very early stages of flying and yeah. getting used to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I went solo in about June 2019. So mm-hmm. Took, took me a while but then you've got weather and everything like that yeah um and then yeah progressed well from there mm-hmm. i had a there was, i think there was a whole month of september when i tried to do my qualifying cross country <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. it just wasn't happening for me yeah um so that was end of 2019 then uh covid hit 2020 oh god yeah. yeah yeah so i was coming towards the end of it i was I think I did one skill test. I think I failed on navigation, so I got a partial. Right. Okay. And it just took forever to get yeah. flying again, then back up to the standard and then... Yeah, exactly. That's one it. thing we talk about, actually. So um, people always get panicky about the skills test and what happens mm. if I fail. An actual fail is very rare, but a partial is more common. So yeah. With a partial situation, you've obviously only got to do the bit of the test that mm. where the issue yeah. was. So... So yeah, it's um, people always say to me, you know, what's the pass rate? And I'm like, well, it's over ninety yeah, percent. Yeah, because most people um, they, they pass, or, or worst cases, are partial. But hardly anybody fails a mm. test because you're already at such a standard by that point that you're not going to go forward to test unless you're ready, are you? Well, so I think the only, I think the main part of the test that people seem to get wrong is the navigation because yeah. that's the hardest bit to get right. It is, yeah. You know, the general handling and all the stuff that you've done. Otherwise, you've done yeah. throughout. The so entirety. The yeah, so you're yeah. very used to that. But navigation, it depends on the wind. It depends yeah. what route you're doing. Some, yeah, anything yeah. could happen on the day. Exactly that. So yeah. that's how people probably fail yeah. that section of it. I don't, you know, like I say, I think it's, um, you're so well prepared that, yeah, it's, it can be the circumstance on the day. Like you mm. said, if the wind's a bit stronger than, than was forecast, that kind of stuff. It's, um, but yeah, so, um, so you, you passed in 2020. Um, mm-hmm. Then moved on to L3, and that was an integrated course. So mm-hmm. can you tell us how that started? Yes, yeah, so, well, I passed my PPL uh, September 2020. Yeah. Um, and then pretty much the month after, in October, I applied mm-hmm. to L3. Yeah. Uh, I think, so what you do before, when you get, um, when you apply to them, mm-hmm. they give you like a, like an assessment test, because yeah. for me it was online because it was still COVID times. Yeah. Um, but you would do... Uh, I've done how to describe it, but it's yeah. like an, like an, an online assessment that would test like your reactions and your like multitasking decision making, like a psychometric. Type yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of like that. Yeah, seeing all the different, I would say non-pilot aspects, more yes. of like your behaviours and yeah. how how would that you know work towards you being a pilot, see if you're the yeah. right fit for that. Yeah, and if you pass that, you then go through to an interview. Yeah, again, mine was online, so. Yeah. comfort of your own home so i was yeah. quite fortunate at the time um but yeah after i think within five or ten minutes after completing the interview called up and said i'd passed i, okay. I got through so that was quite good it's interesting actually you say about the kind of the testing you did beforehand to check your suitability now yeah obviously um at ppl level uh we don't do any of that no. stuff however it does come to light during the training that some people haven't got the right attitude to mm-hmm. learn to fly. Yeah. And in the past, we have had to tell people that we don't want to train you because you have a terrible attitude towards safety <laughs> yeah, exactly. and authority and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't come across very often. But when you go to a professional level... Oh, um, you're weeded out straight away exactly. before you even start. Exactly, yeah. 
Um, so then into, um, this was your ATPL ground school, that mm-hmm. was full-time, was it? Yeah, full-time, Monday to Friday. Okay. Um, that took me, well, you can take it, I think it's six months now, because obviously there's no COVID, there's no, yeah. you know, problems with that. Yeah. Um, with me, I struggled a bit more with the theoretical side, so it okay. took me uh, 11 months in the end. Yeah. But the ground school uh, is split up into three modules. Well, it was, okay. I think it is mostly for most flight schools now. Yeah. Um, and so you've, you've got 13 subjects that are split yeah. up into these uh, three modules. Mm-hmm. So we had, uh, mod one was principles of flight, aircraft general knowledge, HPNL and meteorology. Yeah. And then would you, do you sit an exam after each um, subject or is it a case you're learning bits of each subject? And Yeah, so... On that um, like Monday to Friday sort of routine, yeah. you yeah. might have principles of flight on the Monday, then met yeah. on the Tuesday. You know, you'd have yeah. something different every day. Yeah. Um, but obviously you'd come back to it and you do like little bits of the course as you move forward. Yeah. And then as soon as you get pretty much halfway yeah. through all of those courses, you then do yeah. like a progress test. Right, okay. So just to see how you're getting on, it's a good idea. Yeah. You know, see how you're doing. Yes. The school can see how you're doing, how you're progressing. Yeah. Um, and then once you finish those courses, they then do a school final. Yeah. So to see how you've, see if you're ready to be put forward into the real ones. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, you go and do your real CAA uh, exams at the end of that. And how many attempts do you get on those? I think it's very similar to P- PPL. Four, you like, get four. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. Um, so then you were obviously module two and three. Mm-hmm. Um, now... There are more subjects, aren't there, obviously, than in um, in the PPL stuff. So it's broken down into more yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so. I think it's probably fixed to, towards that more ATPL standard. So I, yeah. I don't know if you do. Do you do flight planning in PPL? Flight yeah. Plan- um, yeah. Ra- radio nav. Uh, well. Radio nav. You might have little bits of it. Yeah, it's not a separate exam no. on it, no. Okay. No. No, so I think with a PPL, I think you've got all of the subjects mostly. Yeah. Whereas with ATPL, it's more split up because they're going to deep, you know, more detail yeah. with that. Well, you've got like Gen Nav, haven't you? And then Radio Nav as a separate. Yeah, thing, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, and then you'd usually come, yeah, they split like performance and mass and balance as well. Yes. And mass and balance, I don't know if it's a different exam for PPL or if it's just like. No, 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 it's, just, no, it's not, no. So it's, you don't have a mass and balance exam. Separate. No, it's just like learnt as you go, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it, I can't remember which subject it falls under now. I think it's uh, probably flight planning and performance. Mm-hmm. Um, so that process for the um, for the theory side that took what twelve months? Did you say eleven months? Yeah, eleven, twelve months for me. Yeah. Okay. And that's you know that's it's different for everybody, isn't it? It's um, yeah. Some people find like the practical side easier than the theory side, and then they? vice versa as well. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the the people that are, I didn't start till I was twenty one. Yeah. Ha- I'd have there were the uh, people in my same group that would be you know finishing college at eighteen and going straight into it. Yeah. And they'd be more you know up to the theoretical side. And they'd be yeah. You know, bang 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 pass pass pass, and they'd have no problems. Yeah. And you get to the practical side. Yeah, and then that's where the performance starts to dip a bit, and yeah. they're struggling with it a lot more because they've got no experience either. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you know, if you've got a PPL experience, you already you know, if you can't get the theoretical, you'll definitely have the practical because you've got the experience there. Yeah, and how did you sort of prepare for the exams? Then, so you said you've had like progress checks during you know midpoint. Mm-hmm. Did you do like a series of mock exams, you say, before you get the actual ones? Or? Yes. Well, it's just the one school final for each subject. So right. if you do meteorology, you'll do, you know, if yeah. you go through the whole course of it, if it's like one subject, you do mm-hmm. progress test halfway through it, yeah. school final at the end of it, and yeah. then your real exam. Okay. And then after the ground school then, so you did all of the subjects, passed all of those, and you could, I take it you can't move on to the flight train. Well, you, you you can't, can you? You can't no, move on you to ha- the flight train. No. Um, I don't know if it's with every school, but certainly with L3, it was do yeah. all the ground school first yeah. and then you can move on to the practical side. Yeah. 
I mean, on a modular basis, the, doing the CPL training is a prerequisite, the ATPL is. So you have to have done your ATPLs before you can do the mm, CPL. CP, yeah. So I guess that's why they do it. Um, but interestingly enough, what, um, what is interesting here is you were saying that some of the people that went on your course had zero flying experience. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they're doing this. Straight yeah, up. just straight into it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, I think. it's It obviously works, but it's just different. So well, yeah, for the most part, yeah, you might have the one or two that realise, you yeah. know, even in the early stages of ground school, that they're not up to it. Yeah. And then that's when they, they drop out of it. Because I think that's the massive difference, isn't it, with integrated and uh, modular, is that um, you don't do any PPL training. You do the single engine training, mm-hmm. yeah. but you could go into it with no PPL and finish with no PPL. Yeah, because there's yeah. there's not there's not a, any point during the course where you where you get a PPL. It's just straight to CPL. Yeah, yeah, that's that's different. So flight training, and so the basic flight training, hundred hours on single engine, and that was in Portugal, wasn't it? Yeah, I did that in Portugal. Um, so that was January twenty twenty two to uh, September. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was I'll probably say a bit more than basic training. Yeah, because you go. Um, single engine, as you said, probably about 90 to 100 hours. Yeah. Um, that would, that took probably about six or seven months mm-hmm. doing the very basic stuff all the, yeah. up to PPL standard. Yeah. Um, and then you'd do a bit of basic instrument flying for, yeah. for a few weeks and then you'd move um, onto, the tw- onto the twin before yeah. going for your CPL. So did you find you had a distinct advantage over people who didn't have the PPL? I think s- certainly up to... Yeah, up to the stage where we went, you know, before uh, the twin. Yeah. But all of that, the single engine. Yeah. You'd have a head start. You'd help out others, obviously, Mm because you just want to be a nice person along the way as well, make friends. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you've got a, you have got that advantage over the others, Mm -hmm. uh, certainly to begin with. So after that, then you went on to the DA42 for the twin stuff. Yeah. So that's your multi-engine, and then you did the CPL on the twin as well. Yeah, is that right? So you okay. so you got the uh, MEP yeah. multi-engine piston rating yeah. along with your CPL at the same time. And would that have been a MEIR then? Because you did your IR on it as well, or did you? Do uh, I did my MEIR back in the UK, so right, it's just okay. uh, CPL and the MEP going with that. Yeah. So it was that, was it only the single engine stuff you did in Portugal then? Or? Yeah, the yeah. single engine was all out there. Okay. Um, then on to UPRT, so upset recovery training. Um, so tell us a bit about that. What aircraft did you do that in? Uh, I think it was a Slingsby. Oh, a Firefly. Fly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and interesting. Uh, oh, it's 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 a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, but you get to see. I think because it was, it was very less theoretical based. You got the yeah. the basics of you know how you get into a stall, how you get into a spin, things that happens, yeah. how to recover from it. Yeah. But very, I would always say almost like, like military, like straightforward. If yeah. you get into this position, you do this, followed by this, followed by this. Yeah. And it was just straightforward, yeah. you know. Yeah. No going around the house, it's just bang, straight there. I think it's probably what it needs to be like. Oh, of it? course, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're lower down. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so did you find the training up to this point quite structured? Obviously, I, I take it the single engine was DA40 as well. So. The single engine... Um, <coughs> in Portugal, I think it's a, they do it out in America now. Yeah, um, and I think that's all Piper Archer actually. Oh, okay. In the U, they do some in the UK, but not yeah. for uh, English students. Right, they've they've okay. got like uh, external students from like Japan or the Middle East. Yeah, and they would do it on the DA40 uh, okay. in the UK out in Cranfield near Milton Keynes. But it's all G1000 equipment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or glass cockpit. Yeah. Okay. So you don't do any steam stuff. Not at all. No. no, just all glass cockpit. And that's another interesting thing, isn't it? Because if you did a modular PPL, you're inevitably going to do it on, on steam. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, um, so you you had a bit more experience from that level as well. Yeah, you've got both sides of it. Yeah. Especially with some of the standbys as well. They might yeah. be steam gauges. So course, you already understand yeah. how yeah. those work. Um, so APS, so that's Autopilot Systems and MCC Multi-Crew Collaboration, isn't Cooperation, it? yeah. Cooperation, yeah. Cooperation, yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell us about that. What what's involved in that, and, and what aircraft do you do it on? So um, with L three, they they mm-hmm. uh, they alternate between the A three twenty and the seven three seven. Okay. So it's really look yeah. at the draw, what you get. Yeah. Uh, we're all 
hoping for the A320 because it's a, it's a bit <laughs> <laughs> flies, flies. So when you say you alternate, easy. is you you stay on one? So yeah, you yeah. you'd stay on one for for the duration of that course. But what yeah. I mean is like different groups. So yeah. if if you'd have one group that would be on the A320, then yeah. a couple of weeks later, yeah, that might change it to the 737. Okay. Um, so what's what's included in that course? What do you actually do during that training? Um, I think, I mean, as it says, multi-crew cooperation. Yeah. It's the very first time that you're learning to fly with another person. Yeah. So you think, you know, pilot flying, you're the most yeah. important person. But actually, the pilot monitoring, I would yeah. say, arguably is a harder role. Because yeah. you're, you're doing all of the, you know, comms and yeah. possibly navigation and all the, you know, the non-flying aspect yeah but at the same time you're monitoring what the person flying is doing as well yeah so you've got almost not quite an overload but you get in there mm -hmm. so there's a lot going on at the same time i think it's it's interesting you must have noticed this when you start taking passengers and things like that and your single mm. engine or even when you start flying have you done any flying with other pilots and things and uh not yet no no, no but but it's, I plan um, to. you kind of get a little bit of that um thing in the cockpit where you've you if you say you're going on a long trip and you say right you know can you help me out with the radio or whatever you mm -hmm. want you know if you don't want to do it all yourself for the three hours you're flying or whatever then you get a little bit of that but without the training and things can yeah, go yeah, wrong yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? so i always yeah. say to people when you fly with people make sure you set some sort of ground school yeah some, some sort of boundaries rules and yeah. things rather on the ground uh, yeah it's, it's very strange very strange um so Let's have a look at the next one. I'll have to edit this bit out, I think, because we're fumbling around with it a bit. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so we said, did you find your PPL experience was significant? Um, yeah, so it gave you a significant advantage over other candidates. Yes, yeah, cer yeah. certainly early on. Fact, you, let's you, do that. Let's cut that yeah. and do it again. Do you think your PPL experience was a significant advantage over the candidates you started with zero experience? Certainly. I think with already having that experience, you're already going into it knowing what to expect you, yeah. you think right i've got this lesson next i've done this before in ppl mm -hmm. so i can just you know knock it sh out of the park sh straight away you just know what you're going to do yeah whereas you know other students would be having to think about all night you know chair flying it as well a yeah. lot more thinking how am i going to do this yeah um so at the end of the course, what I found really strange is this whole thing about not having a PPL. So you have a PPL. Yeah. But these are the people, basically, what, what can they use their license for? Well, because you've got the CPL just with the MEP, right. the only thing you can fly is yeah. multi-engine piston yeah. aircraft. You can't go onto singles unless you get yourself a, an SEP. Yeah. Other than that, you've got to go, you know, if you can't get an airline, yeah. you've got to try and get, spend an extra, you know, however much it is to get a type rating. Wow. So it's either one way or the other. You either get your SCP and fly and just yeah. keep your hours up or try and force your way in yeah. by getting a type rating. Strange scenario, isn't it? Yeah, it's because strange. I think with an SCP, it allows you, you know, certainly if you're not earning anything because you're not an airline yeah. yet, it's it opens another door for you because it's a lot yeah. cheap. It's a cheaper way to get hours yeah. over, an, over an MEP or type yeah. rating. Yeah, exactly. What did you find most challenging then about the training? So let's forget the PPL for now, but the yeah. commercial side of it. I think the most challenging is probably the ground school. Yeah. It's just, you know, hard work every yeah. single day. Yeah. It, you know, whether you're brilliant at theoretical or, you know, not that brilliant. Yeah. It's just hard work. That's, yeah. that's, that's probably the most challenging because mm -hmm. you just got to keep going and going and going and going, especially ground school, because you're not doing any flying. Yeah. It's just, you feel like you're back at school. Yeah. And if it keeps going, like I had COVID, where it prolongs it, you just feel like you're there forever at, at you know, certain stages. Can't see the end sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suppose if you're finding some of it more difficult as well, it's a bit maybe disheartening as such or yeah it feels like you've you've dug yourself a hole and you can't you can't get back out of it especially when you like i got mod two where it's like yeah. gen nav and performance yeah. and instruments yeah um you know very you know hard subjects both for you know mathematically yeah. trying to get all of those equations going yeah. but then also with the um memorizing of all the instruments yeah and knowing you know what bit does what what happens if it goes wrong yeah 
So yeah, There's a lot to take in, it's, isn't it? Yeah, especially yeah. when you're right in the middle of it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't, hats off to you, mate. I think it's, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's definitely hard work. And so tell us about living in Portugal because, you know, you're a young guy. I know some of the people that went there were younger than you. And it's yeah, like, yeah. that to me sounds, it sounds quite terrifying for a young lad going out mm. there by yourself to do, to do this training. And, you, you know, you're at, how long were you out there for? Uh, nine months. Yeah. Nearly, t- nearly 10 months. So it's, uh, yeah, that's quite, I mean, how did you find it? Well, well for, I'm quite fortunate in the fact that I've already got a home over in Portugal. Okay. So I've lived there for quite a few years anyway. Okay. It was a different part of Portugal that we flew in. Yeah. But it was still, you know, I'm used to the culture. I'm used to how things work, the people and things like that. Yeah. So it was just, you know, I already know it. So let's just go and fly the plane because I'm, I'm used to it. Yeah. But for people, exactly as you said, I have people that are younger than me who have never been. Yeah. You know, they would... It took them quite a few months to get used to the country at first. Yeah. And then they could, you know, got more confident in their flying because yeah. they got used to the culture around them. What about like the temperatures and things as well? Yeah. There'd be days where, <laughs> where you'd get in the plane and you think, bloody hell, it's hot in here. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, you're already sweating before you get in there. Yeah. You, you'd, you'd be touching, you know, 40 degrees sometimes. Wow. And, and when, I when flying stops then, or um, I think it was it was either forty or forty five right. degrees where you just you couldn't yeah. do it not just because of you but because of the computer yeah, yeah. you know or the avionics they couldn't work in that heat yeah, yeah so it'd just be like well we can't do it because it's too hot I suppose the aircraft performance is massively impacted as well yeah and then you'd also get in the you know in the early hours you know if you got a flight in the morning you'd be okay. Yeah. But as soon as you get past, you know, 12, 1 o'clock, the thermals start coming. Yeah. And it's not only hot, but then it's, it's bumpy as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't I mean, sound nice. Especially when you're at low levels trying to do either circuit work or, you know, yeah. if you're at two or 3,000 feet just cruising along. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's it, pretty, yeah. and hazy as well. So you've yeah. got a lot of different factors trying to... <laughs> that's, that's funny because everyone always says to me about, you know, when should I learn to fly? Oh, I'm going to start my training in the summer. I'm like great okay <laughs> it's going to be hot it's going to be bumpy the mm. fizz is going to be crap some days you know and they just think oh i didn't even think about that well you, you wouldn't you wouldn't but, no because you, know, you don't think about that when you're on the yeah, no. when you're on the ground as well like a day like today is a good day you know a wintry not wintry but we're sort of autumn, autumn yeah. yeah spring and autumn are probably the best time best times to fly yeah, yeah you can get your odd you know beautiful winter day yeah, yeah but i think the best time is probably may and september if you're going to pick them yeah so the, the obviously how, the weather you're saying uh, you know how did it compare to the uk for example so um ooh, well i think well you could probably compare it to the ppl training mm-hmm. whereas you know you could you'd have a week where it'd be you know bad weather the whole week and you might yeah. get one day where it's you know less cloudy or a little bit of sun coming through yeah. whereas in portugal it'd be just like sun 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 you know all the time yeah but then you might have periods because we were closer to africa yeah you'd get you know um a southerly wind and then all of a sudden you've got sahara dust everywhere and you oh, can't right. fly through that at all yeah or you know in the august and september you've got yeah. more likelihood of thunderstorms as well yeah and that just completely you know for that month See, that's, that's the thing. I think a lot of people, including myself, have got mm. this perception, right, you go to Portugal, you can fly every day, all year round, da 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 da, da sort of thing. Yeah. And it's just not the case, is it? Well, I think, because be- I went over in January, I think right. the best flying months yeah. were January and February. Yeah, Because yeah. it was sunny. Yeah. And it was cool. Yeah. And you just had, it was the best time to fly. Mm. And you got further along, and it just got worse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's interesting, because I did honestly have this perception that it would be great yeah. to fly over there. From what you've told me, it doesn't sound too nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so what part of the training do you think you, you most enjoyed? And, and conversely, what did you most uh, dislike? Ooh, I think most enjoyed would it's it's a toss-up between uprt yeah because that's just a load of fun packed in two or three yeah. days you know yeah. loops spins you know uh, inverted flying as well yeah. every bit of you know, aerobatic flying you want to do yeah. it's in there um and then i'd also probably toss in aps mcc right okay. at the end because it's it, i would say it's quite a challenging part as well because yeah. it's just it was two two or three weeks and it was just you know day after day just keep keep going it you know there was no real breaks because as soon as you did your session yeah you were then revising and looking up you know what you were doing for the next one Mm -hmm. and looking at both roles because what you do is you'd have uh like a four hour slot and two hours was pilot monitoring and then you'd switch over and 
oh, two wow, hours of pilot okay. flying. So it was just, I think it was, it was very um, joyful in the fact that you were doing it every day and yeah. you were learning new stuff every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every day had something a bit different. Yeah. But yeah, it was probably between UPRT and APS MCC that okay. probably most enjoyed. And then, you know, looking on, you know, turning, how would you say it? You know, looking on the other side of it, the most disliked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I keep going back Still to ground school. school. <laughs> yeah, for it's, it's just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in the PPL, you know, there's you have to be a certain kind of weirdo to like reading the books and doing all the theory, but it's kind of a... You know, it's a necessity, and that's what people don't. Yeah, get. it's it's part and parcel of learning to fly. You have to know all the, you know, all the knowledge behind it, or the air law, or the performance, flight planning, navigation. You know, all the different bits yeah. to how a plane flies. You know how, you know, you plan for a flight. I think I think partly the the ATPLs is probably a bit of a shit filter, really, isn't it? It's, you know, it, it, it is though. It's, uh, if, you, if you can't do that, you can't do the yeah. job. It's as simple as that. Mm. You know, it's. Um, Okay, so let's have a look at this. So you decided to change. Obviously, you were started off on the modular route, effectively. Yeah. What What was the reason you went to integrated? Well, um, I think in terms of, I mean, I'd already spent maybe ten to twelve thousand pounds in terms mm. of money. I was mm. I'd already spent ten to twelve thousand. Mm-hmm. I thought, what's going to be more cost effective for me? Because mm. I'd, I'd prefer to be flying every day. Yeah. I'd yeah, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. I want to get all my you know, ATPL exams done. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at modular and integrated. Mm-hmm. And integrated, I think at the time, was eighty five, eighty six thousand to do the whole lot. Yeah. And on top of what I'd got, which was already 10,000 in, I thought, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's still under 100 grand at that point for the training. Yeah, yeah, you've got accommodation on top and things like that. But for the training, it was under 100 grand. And I thought, well, that's probably going to be cheaper for me in the long run and i'll probably get there quicker yeah because there was a i also there was a couple of guys in ground school yeah uh, atpl that already had their pplz like me mm-hmm. and after they did the ground school they carried on the modular route and got their cpl ir mm-hmm. you know everything else that way and you'd finish before them yeah you know, f- four or five months before them so and that was at l3 as well so do l3 do yes as well? um I don't. I don't know the full aspect of it, but yeah, you could go there just just straight for ground school. I think it was six or seven thousand pounds for the, uh, just ground school. Yeah, I know people have done that. Yeah, yeah. and then they yeah. went. There was a guy that I knew that went off to Sweden and did yeah. you know CPL and IR that way. Yeah, there's so many different ways. Oh yeah, there? you can just mix and match. Yeah, so I yeah. think you've. That's one of the the big differences really with um, integrated versus modular. I think is that you're kind of with a training provider all the way through. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's more security there though. Yeah. With you know with one training provider. Yeah. You just s- sail through it in effect. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any? So let's say if you were a substandard on an integrated course, what mm. is the potential outcome? So if you hadn't done so well in ground school or yeah. things like that. Well, for me, I wasn't that great in ground school and I've touched on that earlier. Yeah. And so it's a bit more difficult for me to get a job at the end. Okay. So theoretical, you know, that I think that's at the moment, Yeah. Uh, there's sort of enough pilots that they're still looking at ground school. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, you know, if you've the less fails you've got, the better, obviously. Okay. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've, I had nine fails throughout the duration of that, and so yeah. it's a lot harder for me to get an airline job straight off. So you, you got through it though. Oh yeah, you still so get. Through. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the main thing. Are there people that don't cut the grade? And yeah, there was a few um, during my time. There was probably three or four. Okay. That, you know, that are in my cl- like sort of class, as you like. And what happens to those guys? I think they, I don't, I don't hear of them anymore. You just, yeah. they, they can't carry on with that. They're obviously, you know, not up they, to the standard of it. With the payments and things, because one thing that's become a really big problem mm. of late is flight schools going bust and things, which is, you know, unfortunately, the industry is is very vulnerable. Um, what happens with your payments? I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's your own personal things. But yeah. But did you have like staged payments or did you have to pay all in one go? Yeah, so um, as you join the school, you sort of pay, I think well, for me it was £10,000 deposit. Yeah. And then I think maybe after the fourth or fifth week of 
being with the school, you started paying more or less four and a half grand per yeah. per month. Okay. It would keep going on like that. Yeah. So by about, I think it was after 13 or 14 months of these instalments, you'd paid it off. Yeah. So I think if you if you hadn't met the standard, yeah. whatever month you'd got to, it'd pretty much stop there, so you wouldn't pay any more. But would you, oh, that's, it's probably a question you can't answer, but would you be refunded any money on that basis? Or I don't know if you'd get all of it or... Yeah. or partial I don't know so it could be a financial risk on that, on that. yeah yeah yeah. Uh, I think so and I think I think that is one of the um, uh, kind of pros if you like to the modular is it's, it's a lot more secure in terms of your it's, financial it's system. more of a pay as you go sort of system yeah exactly so you're more I think you're more secure in that way yeah okay um, so then let's have a look. So if you don't mind me asking, do you know what your current training costs are so far? <laughs> or is it too sore to talk about? <laughs> uh, I think I had a, me and my dad, cause he's yeah, you know, funding yeah. most of it. And I think we got it up to, I think it, you know, with the PPL added on and everything and accommodation, I think it was maybe 125,000. Wow. Yeah. That's with everything. You yeah, know, you're yeah, your dad's good. bitch for many years, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> if it's not payments, it's flights. Yeah, yeah one way or the other. <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, so just a, a quick thing. If you did it again, is there anything you'd do differently? Or? Um, I th- as this keeps going back to ground school, I think I would probably, you know, just go a bit harder on that. Just make sure that all the theoretical stuff was there. Yeah. So it'd be easier for me at the end. Okay. I think that's the main thing you really, because practically wise yeah you know you, you i think f- flying a plane if, if taught right obviously is yeah. it, you know it's yeah. it's like almost like you know riding a bike or driving a car you get used to it and then it never leaves you you say that we, well, we, we, have, <laughs> well, we, we have students that say th- otherwise i sometimes. think when you get to a certain stage i yeah. don't know what what the hours might be yeah but i think after you've got your ppl sort yeah. of standard i think you know, it's harder to lose. Oh yeah, I think I think the more experience you have, yeah, yeah, the yeah. less it, it, it erodes. But I think in the early phases of the training, oh, well, it's much more much, difficult. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Because I finished the training in, with L three in April twenty twenty three, and then I came to you guys. Yeah, in you know a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and um, you know it's my first flight for you know four or five months. Yeah. Maybe, probably like six months actually, and straight away. You, you've got the feel of it again. Yeah. Even if I haven't flown a 172, I've flown a 152. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, you get back to it just yeah. easily. But then, you know, you're talking 200 hours of experience. You know how to fly a plane by that stage. Did you have any things that you thought, actually, I'm a little bit rusty on this? Was there anything that... Um... Um, oh, well, I don't know. I don't think so. No? Oh, that's good. Because, you, you know, you obviously you have a little briefing beforehand. You know what yeah. you're going to be doing. I think maybe, if anything, the landings. Because, yeah. you know, just, you get yeah. to a stage where you're hitting, you know, greasing them every single time. Yeah. But then when you've been away, it's like, right, just <laughs> don't smash the nose wheel in. That's the main <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, don't, definitely don't do that. <laughs> so any advice you'd have for students considering starting training for a commercial or reason? Or? Yeah, so um, if definitely for commercially. I, was, I think the first thing you'd do, get a trial lesson. Mm-hmm. Maybe one or two, just mm-hmm. so you're comfortable with the plane. Yeah. You, you know, it, that, make sure it's for you. Yeah, yeah. And then if you definitely want to go commercially, go for a class one medical. Mm-hmm. If that's what you want to do, get your medical so you know that you're fit to fly. Yeah. If not, if you only want to do it privately, then class two maybe instead. Yeah. But you just got to make sure you're medically fit as well as, you know, that's, enjoying that's being really, in a plane. Yeah, really good advice because I've said that to people before and they're like, oh, it's 700 quid, da, da, da. But I'm like, yeah, but let's imagine that you did all the way through your ppl and your only goal is to go commercial what if you can't get a class mm. one medical yeah you know and and you know some people are like well if i don't get the class one i'm not bothered i'll have a ppl anyway fine but if your only goal is to go commercial yeah you've got to get that class you, one you've got to yeah yeah because it's you know it's 600 700 quid yeah but if you know if you fail it you know oh well you can't do commercial but if you pass it... It gives yeah. you a class two for five years if you're under yeah. 40 anyway. Yeah, so yeah. I, th- I think He's, it's a good investment. So that's, yeah. And... Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you can't claim dementia at your age. No. <laughs> oh, I no, don't know. I think it's good. So we've invited you to come back again on another podcast and we're going to talk a bit more in detail about pros and cons on a short episode of, of Modular versus Integrated. Yep. Um, so uh, what's next for you is the... 
Well, I think, well, uh, I did my SCP. I got, so that's expired my SCP because yeah. I got my PPL uh, 2020. So that only lasts for two years. Mm-hmm. So all I've got at the moment is an MEP. Yeah. So I think I've got it booked in for next week that I can get an SCP renewal. Yeah. And then build up the hours mm-hmm. and probably go into, when I've got enough hours, go into instructing. That's a good, a good point. We'll yeah. do, we'll, uh, we can talk about that later on, as you know. We'd love to have you here as an instructor. <laughs> so perhaps you come on one of our flight instructor courses and maybe yeah. some of the listeners here might be flying with Kane as their instructor at some point in the very near future. <laughs> but no, that's, that's brilliant. So I hope you like this episode anyway. And please uh, remember to like, subscribe and ding the bell for notifications of the uh, next episode. It'd be great to see you on. And thanks again, Kane, for coming on this episode. Thank you for having me. No worries. Thanks, mate. Right, If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.